Bill Foucher was sitting in the parlor of his off-track betting company when Marty Terrell walked up to him with an irresistible deal. Terrell had come to bet on his own horse, and he was confident it would win. He convinced Foucher to stake his money on the horse. True to his word, Terrell's horse won, and Foucher packed his tidy winnings home. Just like that, both men developed trust in each other. But there was one big problem. Marty Terrell never owned the horse he claimed to own. Their relationship would take a drastic turn as they both realized the other person's true intentions. Terrell grew up in Massachusetts with his mother and sister, Marsha Hawkins. He started gambling at a young age. One time, his mother's phone bill ran up to $1,000. She, a single mother working multiple jobs to feed her children, didn't even earn that much in a month. She called the phone company to plead with them regarding the bills, and it turned out that Terrell had run up the bill with toll calls to a New York betting line. Terrell got his first sports talk show when he was a teenager. It was a two-hour program called The Sunday Sports Page on WPOE. He showed incredible potential even at that time, but he struggled to get the audience to call into his show. He gave his sidekick, Doug Stotes, a dime and asked him to call the show from a payphone and disguise his voice. He felt this would encourage other people to call, and it did. But he was fired three weeks later for criticizing the magazine Greenfield Recorder, calling it the Greenfield Distorter. Still, Terrell had undeniable talent. He was edgy and boisterous and knew how to reel in the audience. Bob Diamond, staff at the station WHAI at the time, recognized Terrell's unlimited talent and tremendous vision and convinced the station's co-owner, Ann Banish, to make Terrell the sports director. As sports director, Terrell did high school play-by-play -play of high school football and basketball. The show was successful. It made a lot of money for the station and created more marketing opportunities. But his energy towards sportscasting was a double-edged sword. On the one hand, he was pumping the ratings, but on the other hand, he was stirring up trouble for the station. Once, while covering a match at the Springfield Civic Center, Terrell abruptly cut his set because he saw something that looked wrong and chased the game's officials into the locker room. Another time, he sold cars and promised buyers free snow tires, but closed the shop before buyers could receive the tires. Terrell was a smooth talker who didn't see the need to back his talk with action. He quickly earned a reputation for over-promising and under-delivering. When he left WHAI for another station, he had become, according to banish a station manager's worst nightmare. In 1996, he became the station manager at 1490 AM The Jock. Like his previous stints, The Jock was a huge success. He named himself the Mouth of the Midwest and collaborated with Prairie Meadows track announcer Ken Miller to broadcast Iowa's first ever two-hour sports talk show. At its peak, the station had advertisers paying a record-breaking $150 for 30-second spots. The station went well until 2009 when he went off on his KXNO show, blustering and spewing profanities that got him and Larry Cutler, the host of another show, fired. Jeff Kahn, the producer who failed to mute a microphone between shows, was also fired. For all his woes, many people believe Terrell had a brilliant career as a radio host. Political pundit and former Terrell protege Steve Deese still thinks Terrell is one of the best things to happen to radio in Iowa. According to him, Terrell changed radio in Iowa and brought real, edgy, local talk radio to Des Moines and to Deese. There was no doubt Terrell left an indelible impression on the media in their community. Between 2016 and 2017, Terrell swindled at least eight people for one and a half million dollars. He would contact potential investors, telling them that they could invest in sports tickets, which he would buy and resell at a profit, and they would all share the profit. When he first started this scheme, things weren't looking too bad. He paid his investors back and even gave them VIP access to events. Then he told one lie, then another, and he kept telling lies until he had dug such a deep pit of lies for himself that he couldn't find an easy way out. Not only was he lying and defaulting on payments, but he was also using their money for personal purchases and paying other investors. When they asked about their money, he would give them checks he knew would bounce, then provide them with false wire transfer information. He also engaged in check kiting between September 2016 and December 2017. He submitted several false debit card fraud claims to get cash. In November 2016, Terrell sent out four faulty checks totaling $355,500 
$522 to Burlington. He also collected $15,000 from one man on one occasion and $77,836.34 from the same man on another occasion. In the fall of 2016, he used one of his investors' American Express credit cards to get over $1,000. He then deposited a check for over $13,800 into his 62 and even limited bank account after he had already deposited the check elsewhere. Terrell was so notorious that we may never really know the true extent of his scams. So many of his victims refused to be part of the investigation and trial, perhaps for fear of being identified as someone gullible enough to fall for Terrell's scheme, or because they knew there was no way he would be able to pay his debts. One of his victims was Jason Whitinger, whom Terrell scammed for over $1 million. Whitinger was under the impression that he was buying a radio station in Spencer, Iowa, but Terrell had no intention of delivering a radio station. Whitinger later called him a scumbag, the lowest form of a human being. Before the FBI started investigating him, about 24 people had sued him for various small claims. Ticket brokers in New York and Chicago claimed he had refused to pay for blocks of sports tickets he bought. Some people claimed he refused to pay his debts, and a broadcaster in Texas claimed he refused to pay for airtime he purchased. His ex-wife in Massachusetts claimed he failed to make alimony payments. The judgments against him in these other claims amount to over $4 million in restitution. In 2017, Terrell bought flight tickets for himself and eight friends to see a World Series game between the Chicago Cubs and the Cleveland Indians and failed to pay for it. He owed so many local businesses and his friends' businesses. He even owed his lawyer payment for legal services. To escape the pit he had dug for himself, Terrell filed for bankruptcy. The petition was so ridiculous that it was thrown out of the court window. He owed the government taxes, lied about his earnings, and everything else. He often refused to reply or show up in court when sued. One example of him refusing to respond to a lawsuit against him is when Joseph Farron and Justin Lausch from Des Moines sued him over scamming them off $11,238 for advertising that never aired. After Terrell and Foucher's first encounter, Terrell came back with an even sweeter deal. Foucher's OTB business had been struggling at the time. Terrell promised that he could make a profit if he could invest $3,200 in Donegal Racing, where he was part owner and had a 3% interest in Patty O'Prado. Foucher paid, but Terrell never delivered on his promise. As Foucher recalled later, Terrell was only out to grab me for all that I would give him. Terrell didn't own any horse and he didn't have shares in any company. Foucher died in 2018 and never recovered his money from Terrell. Terrell enjoyed spending money on luxury items. He believed himself to be in the class of the wealthy and prosperous. Everything he did was in excess. He'd look in his car and there'd be four shirts from Von Maurer with the price tag still on. Two pairs of shoes, he'd have $4,000 worth of stuff in his car he'd never worn yet, said John McDermott, Terrell's radio partner while he worked at Jerry Crawford's Toyota showroom during play-by-play -play of the Des Moines minor league basketball team which Crawford owned. Terrell didn't spend his money taking care of his family or home. In May 2014, his house faced foreclosure, but he didn't attempt to leave, saying, there was a second mortgage on the house. I'm paying them and it's over with. His first wife, Margaret Daniello, said he took out the mortgages for the house in her name and didn't make the payments. The house, worth about $200,000, was sold to someone else through a sheriff's sale. When he married his second wife, Stephanie Gifford, he took her on trips to sporting events and they stayed at luxury hotels. She believed he was a millionaire investor and knew nothing about his lies and deceptions. They later got divorced in 2014 and she later said about him, Marty had too many lies and secrets upon secrets. He stole her money, ran up credit cards in her name without her knowledge, and bankrupted her. He's a bully. He's a fraud. He's a liar," she wrote in a Facebook post in 2017. As for his personality, Terrell isn't anyone's favorite person. Even Terrell knows he takes it too far. He says, I've thought about this and I've had time to make some changes about overpromising and underdelivering." But did he? He's a larger-than-life character who had spent the larger part of two decades hopping from radio to radio, gambling away his stolen funds, battling alcoholism, surviving feuds with his contemporaries, and coming back with more lies every time he survived a legal battle. Terrell formed many relationships during his career, and one of them was with Boston Globe columnist Bob Ryan. The relationship was quite surprising. Ryan is an admired author, and it baffled everyone that he could associate himself with a guy like Terrell. Even more shocking is that Terrell dealt with Ryan in the same dishonest manner he dealt with everyone else. Des Moines CPA Becky Kyle prepared a transaction list for Terrell in 2011 that showed six checks payable to Ryan, each for $3,000 from April to December. The checks were payment for Ryan calling into his show and making an occasional in-person appearance. 
Terrell's ex-wife Stephanie Gifford thinks he was clueless about Terrell's shady dealings. But he admitted in an email to Greenfield Recorder that he had received his share of balanced checks from Terrell over the years. Terrell owed him about $30,000 for shows. He was charmingly slippery, Ryan said, but who could have imagined the scope of his machinations? No, I had no idea. In 2019, an Iowa grand jury handed Terrell a 10-count indictment. His offenses included unpaid airtime he bought, two divorces and unpaid alimonies, his home foreclosure, outstanding child support, an order of protection against him for alleged physical abuse, and several civil suits. On March 13, 2020, Terrell appeared before Judge William Mazinek III. He pleaded guilty to defrauding a Red Sox fan out of $4,750 worth of tickets. Someone, an acquaintance with a score to settle, informed the police that he was staying at his sister's house in Deerfield. The police picked him up on an outstanding warrant by Deerfield Detective Sergeant Adam Sakalowski. Bail was initially set at $5,000, but was later reduced to $2,500. The 10-count charges carries a sentence of up to 20 years, but he only got 41 months for pleading guilty to mail fraud in a deal he cut with the police. He also has to pay a fine of $250,000. The hearing was very emotional, with Terrell tearfully apologizing to his victims and tendering a special apology to one of them, identified only as JW in court. That apology didn't mean anything to JW. Terrell admitted his faults and realized that only he himself was making his life a, quote, unending nightmare, and that he knew it would eventually come to this. The court gave him the right to turn himself in after the sentencing. Click to watch one of these next videos. Let us know in the comment section whether or not you think people are born scammers or do people become scammers because of circumstances.